oh, you know, you won't get the woman you want in life unless you smoke the right cigarette, or that was in my day. <laughs> in these days, it's unless you, I don't know, own the right car or wear the right clothes or whatever. There's all this this attempt to get us to accept perceptions. You know, the, the big business perception today, the, the, the perception that, that drives business is that the goal of business is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. It's created a very lousy economic system, something I and a lot of other economists now are calling a death economy, an economy that obviously isn't working. It's causing climate change. It's causing species extinctions. It's causing the coronavirus. When you come right down to it, it's, it, it all of these things add up to that. But it's all based on this perception. And to change that, to create a life economy, we, we, we change the perception. To, to, uh, the goal of business, the goal of all of us is to create long-term benefits uh, for people in the environment. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. A new moment in wireless has begun. T-Mobile and Sprint are joining forces. Bringing together our two networks, T-Mobile will build America's largest and most reliable 5G network. With more towers, more engineers, more bandwidth, and more coverage, you'll not only get the best 5G network in America, you'll also get the best prices. Welcome to T-Mobile. Nice to meet you. John, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. My pleasure, Serene. Thanks for having me with you. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I, as we were saying before we hit record here, had actually heard about your work from friends of mine. Uh, despite being an economics major in college, I'd, college, I'd never read your other book, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. But when I got my hand on Touching the Jaguar and I realized who you were, I you know, couldn't put this down. I, I kind of tore through it. And as you know, I was saying, a lot of my reaction to it was, holy shit, I can't believe these things actually take place. Uh, but before we get into your work, um, I want to start asking you, what is one of the most important important things that you learned from one or both of your parents that have influenced who you've become and what you ended up doing with your life? Well, I think uh, that's a good, good question. Both of my parents came from more than 200 years of uh, Yankees, Vermont, New Hampshire, originally to Connecticut, uh, primarily farming families originally. My dad was the first I and his family to go to college, uh, and uh, uh, he went to Dartmouth, which was right near the family farm uh, and uh, in New Hampshire. And, and uh, you know, my parents were very, very steeped in the idea we should always contribute to something larger than our own life. Uh, yeah, I remember talking to my dad. I, I thought at one point that I, I wanted to be a disc jockey. Uh, you know, play records on the radio because I was I was really into listening to some of those shows. This is like when I was a freshman in college, and I was very rebellious against my parents, who both were teachers. I grew up in a boys' prep school, a, a boarding school, where my dad taught. You know, he never made much money. We had a house given to us, a small one, and we, we I ate in the dining room with two hundred plus boys uh, from the time I was about four. Uh, we weren't wanting for any of the life's essentials. But we had very little money, and yet I was surrounded by extremely rich boys all my life. And I was, I, 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 the last thing I wanted to do was be a teacher. And I, so I thought, well, I could be a disc jockey. And they were making a lot of money in those days. And my dad used to say, yeah, well, that, that's okay if that's what you really want to do. But, you know, you might want to do something that, that gives you satisfaction that you're helping other people. And he said, you know, as a teacher... I don't make a lot of money, but I, I know that I've helped a lot of people. And my students come back after they've graduated from college and got out into the world. They often come back and thank me for what I taught them. And he said, there's nothing more precious than that. And my mother felt very much the same way. She was also a teacher, and not, not in that school, but in the public schools. And eventually, actually, in that school when it went co-ed. Uh, and so that was, a, that was a very important teaching to me. They also taught me that when you take on a job, do it. You know, do what you have to do. Roll up your sleeves, 
and and really go in and do it and uh, be, be have perseverance and stamina and don't give up uh do the job but do it with with compassion kindness don't 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 screw other people to get your job done figure a way to do it with compassion and kindness i think those are two very very important lessons that have stayed with me all my life mm. and it, it certainly influenced my writing <laughs> You know, yeah. Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which became an all-time bestseller, uh, it sold over two million copies. It was rejected by thirty-nine publishers before a small house finally took it on and and sent it, you know, sent it around the world. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you know, those words of my parents to be to, to persevere, to not to give up, uh, really stayed with me when I kept getting rejection letter after rejection letter from one repub- from one publisher to and to the next one. Uh, And so the perseverance idea and sticking with it. And of course, all of my books are guided by the idea that it's about making a better world for for people and nature. It's not just about making a a better life, a better, uh, more materialistic life for ourselves. Yeah. So one thing, speaking of materialistic lives, I mean, you mentioned that you were surrounded by, you know, these boys who had a lot of money growing up and we figured, you know, prep schools. So what are what are our misperceptions of what these people's lives are like? Because, you know, I, I had a guy here who uh, was the you know potential heir to the H&R Block family fortune. His uncle was R Block of H&R Block. And due to a difference in values, his uncle, he walked away from it all. And he said, these people don't live the charmed lives that you think they do. But you had been around them since you were a kid. Um, which is really unusual. Like, what do we think uh, about their lives that is inaccurate? Do you think? Well, perhaps one of the an example is that so in the in the state of New Hampshire, there were at least three very very highly respected boys. All those these prep schools were boys prep schools, boarding schools in those days. Exeter and Andover and and uh, Saint Paul School. Uh, and th- those were the chosen ones, and, and 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 graduates from those schools almost always went to Ivy League colleges. They had a very high rate of that. Uh, the school where my dad taught, which was called Tilton, was a rung lower than that. It was da- it was down from that, and so we had a lot of boys that couldn't get into those schools because they didn't have the academic or the qualities, or they didn't have the motivation. And a lot of them came from families that didn't want them at home. Maybe broken families, uh, parks, you know, par- par- beautiful Park Street apartments that they grew up in in, uh, in New York Street City and Park Street or in Paris or in London or Buenos Aires. Very, very wealthy, but they didn't have much love. Uh, and I saw that. And uh, they're broken families. And for at opening day or graduation, some, many of the families would come and they would arrive in these limousines. And they, would, they might have flown up to Boston from wherever and then rented a limousine to bring them up to. Hilton, um, and the parents were just, you, you could tell that it was a sad state of affairs. These boys had, a lot of them, this is, this is the generalization, but a lot of them had very miserable lives. And the, parents, the, the parents just wanted to get rid of them, send them off to a boarding school for whatever reason, because there was problems in the family, because the, the boys themselves were problems, whatever. Um, and so I saw that side of, of, of it. And yet still, when these guys went home for Christmas vacation, you know, eventually I became a student at the school, uh, and uh, for four years in, in high school. And my classmates, they, they would go home for Christmas vacation. They'd come back with these amazing stories, debutante balls they went to, and and women they, you know, girls that they that they had sex with, and and on and on and on, <laughs> orgies. And uh, I, you know, as I, now I look back and I think, well, probably a lot of it was highly exaggerated. I don't know. But I spent Christmas vacation in the school gymnasium, which my dad had a key to. He was a soccer coach. And uh, shooting baskets all by myself or hitting a tennis ball against the wall all by myself. Very lonely. There were no other kids around at the school. It was up on the hill. The town was down below. I'd kind of, uh, you know, I was now a preppy, not a townie, so I didn't really hang out with my old friends very much. It was very lonely. Uh, So... I still, even though I saw that, that these kids came from broken families, to me, and I had a, a very loving family, uh, but to me, you know, as a teenager, male hormonal issues set in, and I just wanted out of there so badly. I wanted the life these guys had. And, you know, eventually I got it. 
When I became chief economist at a big consulting firm, an economic hitman, if you will, I finally I find myself flying first class around the world, uh, staying in the best hotels, eating in the finest dining uh, restaurants, uh, whining and dining with, with heads of state and, 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 and many other people, stars and starlets, beautiful women. And uh, I, I'm living that dream that I'd had. But once again, you know, it, eventually I had to face the fact that I was not happy with that. Mm. I didn't like it. I wasn't happy. That's not what I wanted to do in my life. And I, asked, I actually had to face the fact that I was essentially living on Valium and alcohol at night and tons of caffeine, coffee in the morning so I could get up and go to the meetings that I had to attend as I flew around the world. Um, so I, I have to say, Serena, that I, that, you know, from I, I'd begun as a kid to see these, the, 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 the fissures, the breaks, the cracks in the wealthy system. Uh, but I'd also bought into it for a while and, and then really began to see that I would m- money and that kind of life doesn't bring you happiness. Uh, at least yeah. it wasn't bringing me happiness. And the important thing is to, is to follow our hearts, our, our own dreams, to do what, what it is that we really, really want to do. Yeah. So I, I want to come back to, to how you get to becoming uh, an economic hitman. Uh, in fact, let, let's let's actually go there because I think for our listeners who are not familiar with you know your work and, and who you are, um, one, how in the world do you go from somebody who starts at Dartmouth wanting to be a DJ to doing this for a living? And for people who are not familiar, can you explain what it is that you actually did for work? Because like I said, to me, it was just like, holy shit, I can't believe this is actually going on. Yeah. I'd be happy to. And, and I didn't go to Dartmouth. My dad did. Oh, I was in, it was an all-boys school, and I was not about to leave this all-boys prep school and go to an all-boys college. I went to a neighboring college. It's actually a very good one, too, Middlebury College, but it was, it was co-ed. And, and, uh, and then I eventually I ended up going to Boston University. Uh, but in any case... Uh, so what does an economic hitman do? I think that was your question. Is that, is that right? Yeah. What, what does an economic hitman do for the people who are uh, not familiar with your work? And how yeah. in the world do you get into this line of work? Well, uh, <laughs> two, two, two big questions. Let me start with what we do. Uh, so my job really, and, and I ended up having uh, anywhere from 35 to 50 employees at, from time to time. Some of them were consultants, but I had a pretty big staff. Uh, my, my job really was to identify countries with resources that corporations want, like oil, and then arrange a, a huge loans to that country from the World Bank or its sister organizations. Uh, however, the, the money never actually went to the country. It would instead go to our own corporations, U.S. corporations uh, that would be hired to build big infrastructure projects in the country, power plants, industrial parks, um, highways and, and ports. Things like that. So the, the, the country never saw the money. It would go from a bank in, let's say, Washington, D.C., the World Bank, let's say, to uh, Houston, to Brown and Root, or, or to Bechtel in San Francisco. Never actually passed through the country, but the country would, would assume the debt and put up its, its uh, resources as, as collateral on the debt. Um, and so and these companies that got the contracts made huge profits off yeah. these contracts. And then a few wealthy people in the countries benefited, uh, the, the, the families that own the industries, that own the commercial establishments, the banks, and so forth, that benefited from more electricity, cheaper electricity, more highways, more ports, industrial parks, and so forth. But the majority of the people suffered because money was diverted from education, healthcare, and other social services to pay off the interest on the loans. And in the end, uh, the principal could never be paid down. And that was actually part of the strategy. And so we'd go back in. Uh, I'd go back in. Uh, usually now hired by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to restructure the loan. And that meant that we re- require that the country meet certain con- what we call conditionalities. These conditions would be things like you, you've got to sell your resource, your, your oil or whatever the resource happened to be, very cheap to our corporations with no environmental or social regulations. Privatize your public sectors, your, your education systems, your utilities, uh, your uh, maybe your jails, whatever, and sell them to our investors cheap. Uh, vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba. Uh, let us build a military base on your soil. Things like that. In essence, 
uh, creating a, a, a sort of a modern form of empire of colonialism. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to say that in the beginning, I thought what I was doing was the right thing. Because in business school and in the World Bank, um, you we're taught that when you invest a large amount of money in a poor country, its economy grows. And it does. Statistically, we can show that the GDP grows when this happens. And so it looks very good. Uh, and in conf- confessions, uh, in, so, sorry, in uh, Touching the Jaguar, I write about how our reality is molded by our perceptions. And in this particular case, what we created this perception through reports, through fancy econometric models and statistics. We created a, an impression that when these countries went into deep debt, uh, their economies would grow and everybody would be better off. But not everybody is better off, just a few people. And yeah. here's an example. In the United States today, um, three individuals have as much wealth as the bottom half. When I say bottom, I mean economically speaking, the bottom half of the population of the United States. If those three individuals are, are making 10% growth in their in their income, and the the bottom half, economic half of the population is declining at 3%, we're still showing a growth rate of around 4 or 5% a year. Uh, so the statistics are terribly skewed in favor of the rich. And yeah. that's true all over the world. And so what we were really doing was making the rich richer, as well as helping our own corporations, and making the poor poorer. And the middle classes, lots of times turning the middle classes into, into impoverished classes. And to, and to add to that, to really, when leaders of countries wouldn't accept these conditions, when they had enough integrity, as two of my clients did, Jaime Roldos, the president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos, the head of state of Panama, um, then people we call the jackals would go in and either overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. Uh, you know, and the United States has admitted to doing this and with Allende in, in Chile and Arbenz in Guatemala and Lumumba in the Congo and Ziem in Vietnam and Mossadegh in Iran and on and on and on. Most recently uh, with Zelaya in Honduras in 2009. Um, and these two clients of mine, President of Ecuador and, 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 and uh, Panama, uh, both w- w- would not agree to my terms. And they both... Uh, died in uh, very, very suspicious airplane crashes uh, less than three months apart from each other. They're, they're private planes. Uh, it's never, the United States has never admitted to this. It's never been proven. Uh, but yeah. there's every reason to believe that those were assassinations. So we know a lot of you have been listening to us for years, and it means the world to us. What we do here at The Unmistakable Creative wouldn't be possible without the support of our listeners. If the podcast has been valuable to you, one of the best ways you can support us is to subscribe to Unmistakable Creative Prime, which gives you access to transcripts, all of our courses, monthly coaching calls, live chats with our guests, and an incredible community of creatives. And it costs less than you spend on a cup of coffee every month. For the school teachers and people in our education system, Prime is completely free to help you with this transition to teaching online. We've packed it with a ton of value and actionable content, and we hope you'll check it out. Just go to unmistakablecreative.com slash prime to learn more. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash prime. Wow. So, uh, well, for, first off, you know, it, like I was an economics major in college. <laughs> this job was not one of the things that ever came up as a potential option at Berkeley. It was like, go work at Accenture. If somebody had told me this is what you have the option to do, I might have been like, wow, this is kind of interesting. Uh, so one, how do you get into this line of work? But two, there's one other thing. You say in the book, these stories glorified colonization, a system that I've since learned occurs when a dominant group for our foreign, foreign culture takes control of local peoples to exploit their resources, steal their lands, manipulate their economies, enslave or abuse their men, women, and children, force religious beliefs, language, and culture on them, and break their bodies through violence, imprisonment, imprisonment, and, in some, and sometimes genocide. So how do you get into this line of work as somebody whose parents specifically told you that you should be doing good in the world? And how do you wake up every day with some semblance of morality, knowing that this is where your work is leading? Okay. Yeah. So I, I got into this work because when I was my, my last year in, in at Boston University, I, I, I married a woman who'd been a classmate of mine at Middlebury, and her father was very high up in the Department of the Navy. His best friend was very, very high up in the National Security Agency, the NSA. 
Uh, and as I was approaching graduation, I, the draft would, was I knew would be coming after me. The Vietnam War was on very strongly at those, in those days. I was very opposed to the Vietnam War. I was determined not to go. And uh, so this, uh, it was arranged through this good friend of my wife's father uh, that I could have an interview with the National Security Agency, which could, was draft deferrable. And uh, <clears throat> I went through two days of very intensive interviews in the federal building in Boston. Uh, and uh, this included lie detector interviews and, and so on and so forth. I thought I'd fail because I, I said I didn't like the war in Vietnam. And I admitted that I'd, I'd lied to a police officer at, at Middlebury when the, 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 as a result of a knife fight it <laughs> occurred there with a friend of mine that I was involved in. And I, and I admitted to this because I'm under a lie detector and I figured, well, they don't want me. As it turned out, they loved the fact that I would, would lie to a policeman and, and get away with it and could do it with a straight face. And, uh, and in order this interview, uh, and they didn't care, they knew that the, the United States was losing the Vietnam War anyway uh, at that point. And uh, this is uh, 1968. And, um, and, and I, I know that in those exams, what they discovered is that with my background, I wanted three things in life. I was really, really wanting three things in life. I was wanting money, power, and sex. Even though I was married, I was, I was looking for, I, I still felt this resentment. And I was very, very shy with women. I'd married this woman partly because, I, you know, she became a friend. She sat next to me in, in a class in Middlebury. And it, it just so happened that she really approached me. And, and I was very, very shy. Um, I didn't know how to deal with women. I hadn't seen, I hadn't grown up with many. Um, and so they, they had this information about me. And then I, and they offered me a, a job. What they offered to, uh, you know, send me through training. Uh, it wasn't clear as exactly what I would do. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's around the same time, <clears throat> I went, I just happened to go by a room at Boston University where there was a Peace Corps recruiter speaking. And I went in and listened. And it really struck me as interesting, this, this what he was talking about. And that the Peace Corps was also draft deferrable, uh, not automatic, but it was up to your draft board, but in most cases, NSA and Peace Corps. And, you know, I had grown up, as I say, with, with a long heritage in New England, including a great, great something grandmother who had been captured by Abnaki Algonquin speaking Native Americans, taken to Canada, become a member of the tribe. I was fascinated, I'd been fascinated all my life by Indian law, what we called Indian law in those days. I grew up, I spent a lot of time in the woods as a kid in this, during the summers. And uh, so I went up to this Peace Corps recruiter afterwards, and I, I knew that the only place in the world where people still lived the way I, I sort of wanted to experience was the Amazon. So I, I asked the Peace Corps recruiter, he said, hey, if I were to apply for the Peace Corps, and, and could, could I rec could I ask for the Amazon? And he looked at me and he said, like, he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, if you ask for the Amazon, you'll probably get it because nobody wants to go there. So I did. And uh, I got accepted. And I, I called the guy, my, my wife called Uncle Frank uh, at the NSA and, and told him. And he, and he said, well, by all means, go in the Peace Corps. Uh, we can hire you afterwards, and you will learn another language. You'll learn how to survive if you make it through. You'll learn how to deal with other cultures. You will learn a whole set of uh, tools uh, and, and skills that nobody can possibly teach you otherwise. It'll be very helpful to what we might want to use you for. And he said, and incidentally, you may not end up actually working for the NSA or the, uh, directly or the government. You might end up in private business because we do a lot of stuff through private business. So I joined the Peace Corps and uh, spent uh, just about three years in Ecuador, much of it in the Amazon with indigenous people there. And that's an experience I talk a lot about in Touching the Jaguar. That's where the concept of Touching the Jaguar comes from, a shaman who saved my life while I was in the jungle. Anyway, near the, it, well, about the last year of my time there, I was approached by a, a man who was a vice president at Charles T. Main, the consulting firm I ended up working for. He was in Ecuador developing a big hydroelectric project there, doing the economic hitman work. Uh, and uh, uh, I, he, I later learned that he was also a liaison within the National Security Agency. He was quite high up in the Army Reserve and, and worked, basically, he, he, he carried two, two jobs. He knew he had all the information about me from the NSA 
tests that I'd taken, including the lie detector tests. He knew how to uh, reel me in, if so to speak, you know, money, power, and sex that all drew me into this job. And when I got out of the Peace Corps, he invited me to Boston, where the headquarters of Charles T. Maine were, and uh, I went through some in- more interviews there. But they'd already pretty much made up their mind. I think they needed they needed an economist, and they needed someone who could who they knew would sur- be able to survive and, and produce reports in under very ad- adverse conditions. That they'd had three people before me for that job. This was before there was a department. Uh, the, the, these guys were much better qualified than me, PhDs, etc. But they could not handle living in Indonesia or um, you know, Iran or, or, or you know other places. Uh, and they'd also say they couldn't write a report; they didn't have enough data. Uh, I assured him that I could do that. And at the time, as I said earlier, I thought it was a really good thing to do because I'd been taught in business school and these people really emphasize, you'll be doing good work. You'll be helping these countries' economies grow. You'll be helping the poor raise themselves up from poverty. Uh, It was not true. It was a perception, but it was a very, very strong perception that I totally bought into and believed for quite a few years after I took the job. A new moment in wireless has begun. T-Mobile and Sprint are joining forces. Bringing together our two networks, T-Mobile will build America's largest and most reliable 5G network. With more towers, more engineers, more bandwidth, and more coverage, you'll not only get the best 5G network in America, you'll also get the best prices. Welcome to T-Mobile. Make it bigger. No, smaller, flip it around. Never mind, go back to the original. These are the challenges that designers have to put up with, and thankfully, Shutterstock makes it super easy. With over 340 million vectors, photos, illustrations, and more, you can always find what you need to create something special. Visit shutterstock.com slash unmistakable to get inspired by curated collections and find the best of the best for seasonal campaigns. And right now, you can actually try Shutterstock for free for one month and download 10 free images. To start your free trial, just visit shutterstock.com slash unmistakable. Hmm. So, you know, I know that you alluded to, to um, both the, the divorce from your first wife um, in this in this book. You say, deep down, I was miserable. I drank heavily. I slept with women I barely knew. I anesthetized myself with Valium. I was haunted by nightmares. In the mornings, I'd forced myself awake with overdoses of caffeine. What I wondered from that, with you know, not just with your wife, but how does a job like this impact the relationships that you have with people in your life? Um, and then the other, as I hear you say this, um, and I'm sure you've read the the Edward Bernays book, Propaganda, um, where he basically says that you know your tastes are molded um, by men that you've never met, and I, I can't help but think you are one of those people that he's talking about, uh, and maybe even your colleagues. So, how much of, of what is happening in our lives is largely out of our control, and you know, being basically controlled by puppeteers who do things like this? Well, I think there's two sides to that story, Serini. I think um, that there's a tremendous amount of pressure on us to uh, do certain things that other people want us to do. And that's why in Touching the Jaguar, I write a great deal about how we really have two realities. Uh, There's there's, uh, perceived reality and there's objective reality. Um, The microphones we're talking through right now are objective reality. Most of the words we're speaking are perceived reality. And in fact, objective reality is molded by perceived reality. We we don't have these microphones. If somebody at some point hadn't perceived, hadn't had a perception that microphones could be invented, and now that the internet could be invented and so on. So there's a perception that we can do this, and then the reality comes out of that. If you think about it, there's no Ecuador, there's no United States, there's no Russia, there no there's no culture, there's no religion, there's no corporations, there's no economy except as we perceive it. And when enough human beings accept a perception or codify it into law, it it impacts the reality in a very, very big way. And so part of advertising, part of propaganda, part of what our government does, part of what corporations do is is they they try to get us to accept perceptions that that somebody has decided would benefit somebody somehow uh, if enough people buy into this perception. 
oh, you know, you won't get the woman you want in life unless you smoke the right cigarette, or that was in my day. <laughs> in these days, it's unless you, I don't know, own the right car or wear the right clothes or whatever. Um, and uh, so uh, th- there's all this uh, this attempt uh, to get us to accept perceptions. You know, the, the big business perception today, the, the, the perception that, that drives business is that the goal of business is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. It's created a very lousy economic system, something I and a lot of other economists now are calling a death economy, an economy that obviously isn't working. It's causing climate change. It's causing species extinctions. It's causing the coronavirus. When you come right down to it, it's, it all of these things add up to that. But it's all based on this perception. And to change that, to create a life economy, we, we, we change the perception. To, to, uh, the goal of business, the goal of all of us is to create long-term benefits uh, for people in the environment. Anyway, I'm getting off the subject a little bit, but yeah. it's about perception. And so, yeah, I was very much molded by the perception, first of all, the perception that I was doing the right thing, that the statistics were accurate, that, that when we invest large amounts of money in the electric system of a country like Ecuador, uh, the economy is going to grow. And it does, statistically. But that's a perception. It, 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 it's, it's only a certain segment of the economy that grew, but there's such a strong... That, 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 sec- that sector has created the perception through really phony statistics, skewed bias statistics, that what happens to them is a, is a profile of what happens to the whole country. That's a perception, but I bought into it. I also bought into the perception that I was living the American dream by making a very good salary and, and flying first class around the world and getting all these other benefits and having all these people work for me eventually as I, as I do grew my department. Um, so I was very much guided by the perceptions. But I said the other side of that story is I believe we all have free will. We make our own decisions. And uh, we can look beyond those perceptions, and sometimes it takes a jolt for us to look beyond those perceptions. I think, for example, this coronavirus is a, is a jolt that's going to change our perceptions. That's a longer topic, and if you want to get into it, we can. Yeah, but we I, will. We do, yeah. for sure. I think um, it's but- just fair, fair to say that, yeah, you know, like I was very much influenced by perceptions, and then I realized these are just perceptions. I can turn them around. Hmm. So the other part of this is, you know, like I said, I, I know you alluded to the divorce from your first wife. Like, what impact does this have on the relationships with the people in your life, whether it's your parents? Um, I know you have a daughter. Uh, how does something as as crazy as this impact the relationships you have? Because, I, you know, if I had a job like this, I, I think I would feel really strange talking to my parents about the work that I do. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, <laughs> it affects different people in different ways. Uh, my parents, my mom hated the fact that I was traveling. She, my mom loved New Hampshire. She wouldn't leave New Hampshire. She didn't like to travel. She didn't like to fly. So every time I came home from some exotic place where I'd had a, you know, I'd been meeting with presidents and I was pretty proud of myself. My, I'd call my mom and I, I was living in Boston. She was still in New Hampshire. I'd call her and she'd say, oh, thank God you're home. I'm so glad you're home. And it's like, yeah, well, now that means I got to go into the office from eight to, to five every day and, and sit behind a desk and, and, and write reports. <laughs> when I was in Indonesia, you know, I was staying in a great hotel and eating at, uh, fine restaurants and going out and meeting with interesting people. Um, so, you know, my, but, but I think on the other hand, I think my dad was, was, was proud of the fact that I was an economist and, and fairly quickly after that chief economist. And I think my mom was proud of that, too. So there was a pride there. My wife, and incidentally, she that my first wife and I, we did not have children um, intentionally, and I've had the child since with this, my second wife, my daughter, as you mentioned. Uh, but um, uh, it was it was terribly tough on our relationship because I was with these other women, and and she knew that or sensed it, and sometimes a couple of times she overtly knew it, other times I tried to hide it, but she knew it. And uh, we would we would we would break up, and she, she'd move out to another apartment in Boston. She had her own job, and and come, we'd come back together. She'd meet me in Paris or someplace, and and uh, we'd get back together, and then it would happen again. And it was it was ex- it was extremely difficult. It was extremely tough. Um, so you know it affects different people 
in different ways. And then there were people I hired who I hired a lot of ex Peace Corps volunteers, ones who weren't necessarily academically qualified. They, they might have graduated with a, a, you know, a, a, a liberal arts degree, and I had hired them to do economics studies in, 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 in parts of you know, Asia or South America because I knew that they could that they could do it, that they could live there, and they were smart guys. They could write reports, they could do, and they could survive. So there were many different ways that people were affected. Yeah. So let's talk about this whole idea of a death economy in the context of coronavirus, because one of my roommates said that he felt that this was a long overdue evolution of human consciousness. And I remember, uh, you may have seen it, Edward Snowden did an interview recently with Vice News talking about sort of contact tracing and some of the various measures that people are trying to take. And he said what they're doing is they're building the architecture of oppression. But he said, this has been a very, very unusual time because for the first time in, in potentially human history, or at least in the last several thousand years, we're all being forced to sit at home and think about who we want to become um, and what we want to be when we come out of this. Now, obviously, you mentioned that the economic system that we have in place clearly isn't working. Um, yet, you know, this economic system has also given us things like Amazon. Um, <laughs> so I can order the mic that I'm talking to you on. Um, you know, I can get things delivered. Like we do, we have value that has come out of this system. So I guess the the question then becomes, how do you reconcile that with the sort of self-interest that drives uh, so much of this? Because part of me wonders if, you know, and I, I think it's at this point, it's no secret. I'm not a fan of the president. And I, I think he's the literal embodiment of what happens when we maximize self-interest. Like that is the epitome of self-interest taken to the extreme. So I wonder if if this is the death economy, like how do you get out of this mess without, you know, mayhem. I mean, 60,000 people have died in the last couple of weeks that we know of. You know, I haven't checked this morning. You know, given what you do and the context of your backdrop and everything you've experienced in your life, like, what is the what is the alternative? Like, what is this higher consciousness that um, we could potentially end up in, what you call the life economy? Which I realize we could do an hour just on that question. Yeah, well, we could do more than an hour, but... Um, <laughs> uh, Let's see, where to start? I think, so let me start by saying that if, if, if a number of years, so I, you know, I wrote five books on, on on indigenous people and shamanism before I wrote Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And since then, there have been uh, four, four more books on, or on, on global economics and intrigue. And, um, so for many years, I, I've also taken people to, to visit shamans in Ecuador and, and places. And on one such trip, we were with a lady shaman up in the Andes, a Quechua woman, and uh, with a wonderful name of Maria Juana uh, Yamberla. And uh, one of the, and I'm translating for everybody. And at one, one point, the, one of the people in the group says, uh, "So, how do you, how do we save the earth?" Maria Juana laughed, you know, and she said, <laughs> "You know, Pachamama, the earth is not uh, endangered. Uh, we are, though." Uh, and we, we can take a lot of other species with us. And she said, you know, we're, we're just like so many fleas on this earth. And if we get to be too much of a nuisance, Pachamama will just <laughs> shake us all off. And then she, she pointed up at this volcano that hovers over her home in, in Babura. And she said, you, 20 years ago, that volcano was covered with a thick ice cap. It isn't anymore. Pachamama is twitching. She's sending us a message that we better change. She said, there's no question that we humans have caused that ice cap to melt. We know that. She said, I know that. She said, uh, but isn't it wonderful to live at this time when we've given these messages directly from the earth and we can listen? I thought of that over the years, Serena, as, as the more and more earthquakes and, and, and tornadoes and hurricanes and tidal waves and fires have swept the planet. Uh, it's like the earth has been twitching, speaking to us. And whether you look at this from a shamanic situation that the earth is speaking to us, or whether you look at it from a purely scientific uh, standpoint that the earth <laughs> is speaking to us scientifically, these things are happening because of what we're doing, because of human activity, because of all the pollution and so forth, which we've seen so clearly uh, when we don't have these uh, economic activities, uh, pollution over China and, and Los Angeles and many other places cleans up. 
Uh, so whatever aspect you look at it, we can say that we're getting a strong message, but we haven't listened as uh, globally. And so when you've, if you manage to survive one of these local events, like a hurricane, uh, you know that within a few days or, or maybe a couple of weeks, the outside world is going to come to your rescue. A lot of water will arrive, food, and then some leader will come along and say, hey, we're going to rebuild. We're going to be better than ever. We're going to rebuild the same system, basically, but better than ever. The same system, and that's important. So we really haven't gotten the message as a species. A few People have, but we haven't gotten it as a species. Now this coronavirus is a whole new twitch. Everybody's impacted. Every human being on this planet is impacted by this virus. And there is no outside world. Nobody can come to our rescue. Uh, and we are learning all these new ways of, of, of relating to each other. You know, I just did a, a, a webinar yesterday uh, for people who pre-ordered the book, Touching the Jaguar. And we had uh, live, we had 300 people on there from all over the world. I, I think there were like 25 different countries uh, represented. And there'll be many more people who, who can look at the video. Uh, in fact, if your listeners want to do, go there, they can go to my website, johnperkins.org, and sign up. It's free. Um, but what amazing, you know, an amazing technology to, to reach these people in all these countries. I would have had to fly a lot. I would have had to burn a lot of jet fuel uh, and uh, under normal circumstances. And, you know, we've all had these meetings. The, the conversation we're having now, we're all learning that we don't need to fly around as much. We don't need to drive cars as much. We don't need to go to restaurants as much. We, we don't need, we need to go to movie theater. We, 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 we learn. We can even order our food and many other things online. As you mentioned, you can order the microphone online. So, out of this, I believe, a whole new economy will develop. Uh, and I think it will be closer to the life economy. So a death economy is um, characterized by things that basically destroy the earth, what, what, businesses that are maximizing short-term profits and in the process are destroying the very resources upon which their long-term depends. And human mm -hmm. beings and as individuals doing something pretty similar. The life economy, on the other hand, pays people to clean up pollution. Uh, you know, companies uh, will be encouraged, as they're beginning to do, to clean up, uh, to recycle the pollution in the oceans and in the rivers of Asia, uh, to regenerate destroyed environments, and to come up with new technologies uh, that, that use solar and wind much more efficiently than currently, and maybe use the air itself uh, to uh, create energy, and, and on and on and on. There's so many things that we can do it, this isn't about re going back and living in caves. This is about really developing something new. And we're experiencing this to a degree with this coronavirus. Mm -hmm. The danger here is that if we ever get, you know, get completely through this, a vaccine is, is, uh, is created or is some way to cure this disease. And I, have, I don't know, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. But if assuming that happens, uh, the, the danger here, I think, is, is, is for people to then try to get back to the way we had been. And we'll have a lot of the status quo, the leaders, the politicians, who will try very hard to convince us that we can get back to the old normal. Mm -hmm. uh, we should not do that. If we do, we'll have more problems later on. We need to create a new normal. And that new normal is the life economy. It's a very exciting time. It's, I think it could result in a very beautiful uh, change in human experience on this planet, and, and a very beneficial one, and one that'll be much more satisfying for most of us. Right. Well, you know, I, I agree. I think that absolutely this, there could be this very beautiful thing to come out of it. I think that we are seeing sort of a level of humanity and kindness also that we've never seen before. You know, I remember seeing a story of a New York landlord who basically told all of his tenants, don't worry about rent for this month, which is unheard of in history. But on the flip side of that, you have this sort of self-interest problem. And also, you know, this is just a fresh in my mind because I was reading Nassim Taleb's Skin in the Game book. It, you know, he identifies what he calls the Robert Rubin problem in which you have policymakers who don't actually have to deal with the consequences of their actions on an individual level. So Steve Mnuchin, for example, is not, you know, despite making treasury policy, he's probably not worried about how he's going to pay anybody or keep a roof over his head. Whereas the small business owner who basically gets this, you know, um, bill, you know, bill passed by the treasury is. And in the midst of that, you have bad actors where people like the LA Lakers are taking boatloads of money off of the table. 
And, you know, now giving it back, the problem is even when you give it back, it's like, wait a minute, you did this after a month, potentially the damage is already done. So how do you resolve those two paradoxes? Well, I think you can look at human history and and say that there's always these paradoxes. Um, And in the time of a revolution, which is what we're really talking about now, and we're talking about we're talking about a consciousness revolution, a change in mindset, and we're talking about a, an economic revolution, which is also a social and it will be a governmental revolution if it moves forward. And I believe it will. I hope it will. Um, but whenever there's a revolution, there's a there's a there's a kickback. You know, there's a there are those who want the status quo to continue. They do not want the revolution. Um, I think I've read. You know, historians have 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 speculated that uh, during the time of the American Revolution, when it finally got underway, when we finally just went to war with England, 30% of the, of the American population was pro-Tory, was pro, did not want us to go to war with England, 30%, more or less. And another 30% was, was very pro-war, and then there was another 30% that was ambivalent. And I, I think that's relatively reflective of, of many times in history when there'd been a revolution, when the Industrial Revolution came along, when the rail, when a train came along, everybody predicted that the train was going so fast that it would, we'd lose our brains. The, 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 the train would have a huge bad, bad effect. The same with cars, the same with everything, every major breakthrough. And we, so we're going to go through this again. And the question is, who's going to win? Um, and I think if good revolutionaries, and I, I use that term advisedly because it's not this, we're not talking now about a, a military revolution, we're talking about a consciousness revolution and a revolution amongst businesses of how they define their, their goals and instead of being short-term profits to be long-term benefits for, for everybody. Uh, you know, when, when there's a revolution and, and the, the status quo steps in to stop it, uh, that gives the revolutionaries energy. So if we, you know, feel that, that somebody, you mentioned that your distaste for the President Trump, if you see him as, as trying to, to block this, then you say, well, the reason he's doing that is because he knows we're winning. He's afraid. So he's going to step in and try to stop us. And we can say that about any uh, counter-revolutionary movements, that if the, if the revolutionaries, if those who want change, maybe it's a better term, the change agents, uh, take take energy like good martial artists and from the, those who are throwing the, the opposition at them, uh, then the revolution, uh, the change moves forward. And that's mm-hmm. the time we're in right now. I think, and I think most all of us recognize that we need to change, that the, that the old system just plain isn't working, but we fear change. That's really the Jaguar. So this idea of you got to touch the Jaguar, you got to go and confront that which you fear. And when you confront that which you fear, uh, you touch it, you touch the Jaguar, it gives you energy. Once you confront it, once you know what it is you fear, what you confront it, you touch it, and it gives you the energy to move through the fear and to use that fear uh, to create change for yourself or for the world. And so like the subtitle of con- Touching the Jaguar is uh, tr- um, transferring fear to actions that, that change your life and the world. And that's really what, we, what we're in the process of doing right now. But we've got to touch the Jaguar of fear. Because you and I and most of your listeners may know that we get to change, but they fear it. We all fear it. Like, oh, what does that mean? Does that mean I, I can't travel to South America anymore, which I love? I've got, I got, you know, I got blood brothers there and, the, and so on and so forth. What does that mean? And, you know, more than half the world can't even think about change, really, because they're worried about putting food on the table for the next meal. And that's, that's increased in the last month. Uh, and then there's the people sitting at the top of the economic pyramid. They they don't think they want change because they think they got it made. They got the power and the money. So we fear this change, but we've got to touch this change because we know we've got to move from the death economy to a life economy. We know we've got to move into a new system. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Just as I was hearing you say that, there, there are two things that come to mind. Uh, you know, one, and I don't remember if he was an economist or I know that he, I believe he was in the staff of the Obama administration, a guy named Richard Haas. I saw him on a documentary uh, on Vice called The World in Disarray. And I wanted to get my hands on that book um, because he said that just with everything going around the world, 
it is kind of in disarray. And you look at things like Jair, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil acting the way he does, challenging his own officials, you know, health officials, um, you know, around the world, you're seeing this. But there's one thing I, I wonder, you say human reality is molded by our perceptions. That's the basis for modern psychotherapy, quantum physics, and corporate marketing, and that to change ourselves or our world, we must break through the barriers that imprison us in old ways of thinking and acting. And in the context of a media environment in which millions of people can control perception, I mean, think about it, this, you know, you and I are having a conversation that by all accounts is actually shaping people's perceptions because of the fact that we're creating media. And, you know, you have this world in which everybody has a microphone, everybody has the ability to shape perception. And the result of that is, the, you know, we have multiple versions of what's true. I mean, particularly when you just look at, you know, left wing and right wing media. And, you know, I think that it, in my mind, this isn't about a bi political bias in media, because at the end of the day, anybody who believes the media is designed to inform the public is delusional. Like the media companies exist for one purpose, and that's to sell ads. Uh, and so how do you deal with that when it comes to this perception reality issue, when you've got these massive media conglomerates playing a huge role in shaping perception? I can tell you firsthand that I definitely swing left and there's no question about it that my YouTube watching habits have evolved from Trevor Noah to Jon Stewart. I noticed that that's literally what I get recommended by the algorithm at this point. Yeah. So, uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that those programs that you mentioned and what we used to, what we've called the mainstream media is not so mainstream anymore. Uh, podcasts like yours are becoming yeah. more and more and more important. Uh, and, you know, it, my, my, my publisher of uh, touching the Jaguar uh, is very aware that the, the big radio shows and TV shows that we used to try to get onto back when confessions was published in 2004 and the, the, the book since then, I have become somewhat uh, irrelevant or at least a lot less important that, that it's these podcasts that people, there's a, and there's a lot of them. You're not alone, as you well know. And, uh, and thank goodness, because I think there's a whole new, I, and I, I would suggest that this is now the mainstream media, uh, that, that the, even the John Stewart shows and shows like this that are on uh, national, national television, uh, have become more entertainment. I think a lot of people recognize that, 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 they're, that they are entertainment, but that the real information is coming through the internet, through podcasts, and and through the many other forms that are you know people's blogs and so on and so forth, and yeah, can a lot of it be lies, be false, be that you know to use Trump's term, fake news? Well, sure, there's fake stuff, but there's always been fake stuff. The television had fake stuff, the radio had fake stuff. I mean, it's this is nothing new. Uh, we learn to discriminate some, some, somewhat, but this, but you know, I'm constantly every day I must get a lot of links that people send to me of something that they've heard that they think I ought to hear or see. And it's not, it's not on NBC or CBS or CNN or Fox. It's coming through. It's you. It's, it's this media. So things are changing very rapidly in that direction also. And I think that the, uh, this coronavirus that we're going through is going to strengthen that because so many people now are doing things online, webinars and videos and, and on and on and on that it's having a huge impact. Wow. Wow. Uh, so I think that to me, what is, is really uh, remarkable is that in the face of, of, you know, profound uncertainty, a great deal of tragedy, you seem to remain quite optimistic about where we're headed in the future. It's a lot more fun to be optimistic than pessimistic, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> i got to tell you. No. And as I said, I think earlier that, you know, I come from a long line of Yankee, New England Yankees. You had to be optimistic it's in my genes. I think you, could, you couldn't survive a New Hampshire or Vermont winter as a as a as a dirt and dairy farmer uh, unless you unless you were optimistic that spring was going to come uh -huh. and uh, all the other adversity. And you know, my, my family often talked about how they went through. My grandmother went through World War One, and my parents and grandparents went through uh, uh, the Great Depression, World War Two, nightmarish things, horrible things, and. Uh, they made it. And I've seen that over and over. And it's, in, it's ingrained in me that, that we can pull through these things. And as individuals, we've all pulled through tough times. I've described as an economic hitman. I went through some pretty tough times when I was living on Valium and alcohol. I was, I was on the road to self-destruction. 
and I pulled out of it. And it taught me a lot. I, I think we can, you know, and the fact that my book was rejected by 39 publishers and then, then went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for a long time. All of these things have contributed to me feeling that uh, I have great hope. And I think it's not, not really optimism. I think I see optimism as being a blind faith that something's going to get better. If, for me, it's not blind. Uh, it's, 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 it's well thought out. It's rational. Human beings have an ability to move on to be, and and I think that this this virus is going to show us. It is showing an awful lot of people that we need to change. As you said earlier, it's forcing us all to uh, reflect on who we are and what we are. And the book, incidentally, goes into a strategy that each individual can use to basically ask yourself, "What do you want for the rest of your life? For you personally, what what do you most want to do with the rest of your life? And how does that tie in with making things better for other people?" And what is the jaguar? What are the barriers that stand in your way of doing that? And what do you need to do to touch the, that jaguar, to change the perception? And then what actions do you need to take? Five different questions that you ask yourself. And in the book, there's sub-questions, and there's actually, you know, a whole a daily practice that you can use that's 10 minutes or less a day, or you can do it once a week or whenever. It will guide you through this process. And I think when we do something like this, we begin to see how very, very uh, attainable our goals are, our dreams, if you want to call them that, our higher purpose, our, our bliss. Because when you come right down to it, Serene, no matter how much money you have, if you're not following your bliss, if you're not doing what you most want to do in life uh, what, for the rest of your life, today's the time to start doing that. And if you're not, gonna, if you're not doing that, you're never going to be truly successful, no matter how much money you have. I think that makes a really beautiful place to wrap up our conversation. So I have one last question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Well, I guess that would beg the question of what do we mean by unmistakable? No. Uh, every human being has that ability to be unmistakable in whatever way they choose. I think what it really takes, though, is as I, what I said just a few minutes ago, that we need to follow our passion. If you follow your passion, and every one of your listeners has passion, and every one of them has skills. You know, for example, I have a passion for writing. I love to write. That's, that's my passion. And hopefully I've got some skills in it. If we follow that, if we follow our passions and use our skills to take us to uh, the life that we most want in ourselves, uh, then we become, uh, then we become incredible people, unmistakable people. Uh, and we be, that, that, that is what takes us there, to truly follow our heart. You know, I avoided doing that for a number of years when I was an economic hitman. I wasn't happy. Now I'm doing it, and I'm, I'm very, 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 very happy. Wow. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your insights and your stories with our listeners. I, I feel like I could have talked to you all day because <laughs> your stories are so crazy and interesting. And, uh, you know, it, this has just been such a fascinating look at how the world works. Uh, where can people find out more about you, your work, uh, the new book and, and all your other stuff? Everything's on johnperkins.org. I'm also on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and they can get it all on johnperkins.org and Instagram and they can join the, 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 the Facebook group if they uh, uh, go to uh, touchingthejaguarbook.com. Uh, if you pre-order the book, you, you get all these other things, that, these groups and get into the webinar and so forth and so on. Uh, so yeah, johnperkins.org. And I just want to say, Serena, that I really, really appreciate what what uh, what you're doing, and what you're bringing to the world. As you said, it, we're we're changing perceptions as we have these conversations. And thank you for taking that on and doing it. And I, I know it's your passion, so you're enjoying doing it too, which really shows. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating? inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming. Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. First feels good. Like being first to get your hands on the latest sneaker drop. Hey, yeah. 
Here's a new first for you. Samsung Galaxy 5G. Yes, 5G now on Galaxy. So you can be first to even more. Like being the first of your friends to post an 8K unboxing video of your new kicks. <laughs> Man, first really looks good. Samsung Galaxy 5G. Feels good to be first. Now available on Galaxy S25 G. 5G speeds vary and require optimal network and connection. Factors include frequency, bandwidth, congestion. See carrier for availability.